Hello and welcome. For this week's special guest, we have none less than Professor Ramila Thapar, Emeritus Professor of History at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi, and honorary dean in both the University of Oxford and University of Chicago. Twice, that is in 1992 and 2005, she has refused the Padma Bhushan, a state award, increasing her renown even further. And in 2008, she was awarded the prestigious Klug Prize by the US Library of Congress an honor reserved for those disciplines like history which are not covered by the Nobel Prize. Professor Thapar, it's an absolute privilege to have you on the show. Thank you. Professor Thapar, you most recently and famously said at a lecture given in New Delhi in October 2014 that the dissenting public intellectual has always been present in Indian civilizational history, but that you also said that the need to question is now and that questioning may not be happening. What sort of questioning do you believe is not happening and why is this, there this complacency and silence? Well, let me begin by saying that I think the function of a public intellectual is concerned with basically knowledge and with how knowledge is utilized in the public sphere. And I think uh, it is the function of the public intellectual to protect knowledge where it needs protection, to prevent its abuse, and to see to it that people who want access to that knowledge have access. Now, I think that one of the essential ways uh, that knowledge advances is through questioning. It's not a static category. It's, it's not something that comes as a package and there it sits for eternity. It can only advance if you keep questioning existing knowledge and questioning it not in a kind of wild way where it doesn't matter from which angle you're asking the question, but questioning it on the basis of evidence and questioning it on the basis of what you want to use that knowledge for. So I think that we have arrived at a point where in our transition from whatever we were, a colony, and then after that, uh, a nation state, an independent nation state, we've arrived at a point where we have to decide on whether or not, as a society, we are going to advance knowledge through questioning it, um, advance knowledge to make sure that it reaches the public sphere, um, or whether we're just going to sit back and allow ourselves to be pushed around by those who think that they're in a position to do so. So that was the point where I was saying that I think it is extremely important to realize that we have had in the past, um, for many, many centuries, we've had thinkers and philosophers who have questioned orthodox knowledge. Um, Again, not just to make themselves into public figures, but for very valid reasons where they feel that the questioning requires to be done. Um, and that we should not imagine that this is a tradition that is not part of our heritage. It's very important, to, especially to bring up children, uh, to understand that the purpose of education is that you have an intelligent approach to how you're going to treat knowledge. And that was what I was meaning when I said that it is important uh, to, to discover knowledge, to discover existing knowledge, and then to move on to questioning on the basis of evidence and logical reasoning uh, whether that knowledge cannot be advanced further. Fast on the heels of its massive election victory in May 2014, the current regime in Delhi appointed uh, by Sudarshan Rao as the chairperson of the Indian Council for Historical Research. Uh, on that appointment, you said that you know he's one of those persons who has not tested his academic learning through peer review and rig the rigorness of peer review. And his obsession appears to be a desire to date the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Why is that so essential to the ideology of this dispensation? Well, I think uh, the argument there is that all our texts from the ancient period uh, 
are historically accurate. Therefore, they can be dated and what they say can be taken as history. Now, we historians have sort of spent our lives looking at these texts and saying, we know the texts that come from ancient times are not necessarily historically, historically accurate. And we know that sometimes it's very difficult to date them. Now, this is not something that is specific to the Indian texts. Um, it is something that is specific to the genre, for example, of epic poetry. He speaks very often of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana as uh, being the texts that tell us all about the history of the past, and we virtually don't have to do anything after that. Uh, but this is what we call, and in fact even people in the history of literature call it that, it is a very special genre of writing. It is a genre which is based on an oral tradition, and people get together and they have little stories about each other, about their, the chiefs of clans and possibly rulers and so on, and these stories slowly get amalgamated into a bigger and bigger form until you have these gigantic epics. It's the same thing with Homer. Homer, I was just um, say. Yeah, and this goes on. Uh, now, unless you have an epic that is deliberately created for purposes of nationalism, as for example the Kalevala in Finland, okay. which was deliberately created in the 19th, early 20th century, um, in order to bring all these different Finnish groups together, okay. in the natural course of things, in a period of 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, um, these, these are really essentially conglomerations. So two things happen. One is that the stories as they are put together and the versions that are accepted differ from authorship to authorship. So you have a Ramayan today which is composed by Valmiki. You have another story based partly on the Ramayan, which comes in the Buddhist Jataka text, the Dasarat Jataka, which is different. And you have another story which is composed after the writing of the Valmiki Ramayan by a Jain author who gives a yet different version. So, and this goes on right through Indian history. You've had different versions of what we call the Ram Katha. That's the original story, whatever the original story might have been, we don't know. But there are variations and versions that go on. Now, the Mahabharata is a similar kind of thing where there's a conglomeration of stories that's been put together. And we are not really quite sure as to exactly when this was done. And why are we not sure? Why are we not sure? Because the text uh, is written in a form which can be dated to different periods. Hmm? If you are a really good scholar of both Sanskrit and linguistics, you can understand this argument. If you're not, then you cannot. And linguistics is particularly important to this argument. Um, the, the argument is this, that you, know, you take the text and you nowadays, of course, they put it through a computer. And the Japanese were the first to do this very interestingly. Now it's done in practically every European university. Um, and you give a sample of the particular literary style that comes from some other text of a dated period. And you put that sample in and say how much of this text conforms to that style. And you pull out these segments where it conforms to that style and you're really left doesn't. with the other segments. See, this is one way of dating it. Another way of dating it is quite simple, which is the, the system that we historians use. For example, there is a reference in the Ramayan to the signet ring of Ram. He gives it to Hanuman and he says, she, Sita will recognize you when you show her this ring, which is exactly what happens. Now, H.D. Uh, Sankalia, uh, the great archaeologist from Gujarat, uh, he has argued that the signet ring was introduced to India by the Indo-Greeks, which is about the first century BC Indeed. or so. So he argues that that particular episode, which concerns this object, probably dates to that period and cannot be dated earlier. So there are many episodes like that. There are many objects, there are many literary forms. 
which have to be seen as having been put together at different periods. So this is one reason why you cannot say that there is a single date. And with regard to the, both these epics, um, certainly the, the Mahabharat, the person who headed the team that did the critical edition, uh, V.S. Sukthankar, at the Bhandar, Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute, he gave a span of dates from 400 BC to 480 and said the compositions that go into the making of this text belong anywhere along this chronological range. That's a long span. Which is a long span. And today, most scholars who've worked on the Mahabharata will either agree with this long span, and even those who say it's a shorter span, uh, generally say it must have been at least 100 years for the composition of the text. Therefore, to say that there is an exact date by which we can actually uh, locate this text, the whole text, entirety, uh, seems to me to be unhistorical. But why is it so important for the ideology to why, date it? Well, it's important because, you know, we've all grown up on the fact that there's this theory that India didn't have a sense of history. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans had it, the Chinese had it, and various other people had it, but India didn't have it. Um, therefore, one way of countering this is to say, no, no, we did have texts, and they are historical. Now, what is important, and I've been working on this subject ever since I started research, and I've just put together this very large, fat volume on the historical tradition as I see it where I'm arguing that there was a historical consciousness that goes right back to this period. There was a historical awareness, but it wasn't expressed in terms of, on this date, this happened, which is roughly the way in which we treat history now, or the crudest people treat history <laughs> now. Um, and therefore, what is important is not so much the date and the event that comes out of these texts. What is important is to see what is the kind of society they're talking about. And so now we are arguing, as indeed I have tried to argue, that the Mahabharata is essentially a clan-based society. Okay. Um, and therefore, one is not interested in whether it's historical or not, but it's telling us a great deal about how clans functioned and how different social items, itineraries, ideas were brought in and how the story changed in order to accommodate new social ideas and new social forms. That seems to be much more uh, logical and to the point than going on battling over something which you, at the moment given the evidence, cannot prove either way. But ideologically, the issue is that of uh, we have a history which is recorded in these texts, and of course, the other addenda to this, which is our history is the oldest history in the world. So you try and push the texts as far back um, as you think are the origins of history without really any very substantial evidence on which to base this. No. You've also argued very strongly, as have other independent historians, that colonial historiography did a lot to help the communal discourse later. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, positing the Hindu Arya, which is now the very crude uh, representation, as the real uh, repository mm -hmm. of Indianness and the right to citizenship yeah. and civilization. And linked to that is a very crude version of this 1500 years of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being enslaved and mm. the massacre, you know, using even phrases like the Hindu Kush, which means the massacre of Hindus, and completely twisting the narrative. How much did this colonial historiography feed into this communalist, uh, supremacist history narrative that we are so crudely seeing now? Oh, I think it was a very substantial contribution because you don't find this kind of argument in pre colonial literature. There isn't this supremacist argument about, you know, there isn't the consciousness even of nation according to religions. This is very much something which is a product of James Mill and the early 19th century. James Mill, who wrote the first history of British India in, in English, or in fact, the first, uh, virtually the first, um, 
argues for a periodization of the Hindu period, the Muslim period, and the British period. And where he says that uh, there was a Hindu nation and a Muslim nation, and they were perpetually antagonistic towards each other. You see this, you begin to get that kind of narrative coming in. Um, so that is present. Um, then you get, you know, the golden age is the Hindu period. So that is the first contribution towards uh, a supremacist argument. Um, and then you get the whole theory of uh, the coming of the Aryans, the Aryan race idea. Race has been given up. But what is not understood, of course, and, and here someone like, you know, Max Muller makes a very big contribution. And interestingly, these theories about the origin of the Aryans, the Aryans being a race, uh, the Aryans being indigenous to India and going out from India to the West to civilize the world, these are all ideas that come out of, for example, the Theosophists. Colonel Olcott is the first person who argues that the Aryans were indigenous to India and went out of India to civilized the world. Uh, he talks about them, you know, as a race because the race concept was very common in Europe at that time. It's only in the 20th century that it was given up. Uh, so uh, one, and, and Max Muller, for example, who keeps on saying, yes, it's true that one mustn't confuse language with race because the the label Aryan is essentially a language label. You have to speak about Aryan-speaking people, not an Aryan race or an Aryan people. That is incorrect. Uh, Max Muller does make this distinction and says, you know, you cannot confuse language, which is a cultural item, uh, with race, which is biological. Uh, but then he goes <coughs> on to talk about how Ram Mohan Roy was a very important member of the Bengali race, where he totally confuses language and, uh, and race. Uh, so there is a very close tie-up. And in fact, you know, sometimes I think that a lot of the arguments that come out of the uh, communal ideology as developed uh, in the early 20th century are arguments that are rooted in the colonial interpretation of early Indian history. There is, in fact, a very close connection. So taking off from there and this entire discourse about the desecration of religious monuments, what was the motive behind that desecration? And was it the desecration only under the Hindu-Muslim paradigm? What would you have to say? Well, there again, you see, the point is that one doesn't deny that there was a desecration of monuments. But if you look at it historically, um, it's really quite interesting. One has to ask the question why everywhere in the world, with every civilization and every advanced culture, there are desecrations of religious monuments. And the answer is one, that there is a religious antagonism or a wish to take over a particular place. Uh, two, that there is something political to be gained by this. And three, uh, that there may be a financial gain. Now, in the Indian situation, it is a very complex story. And simply to say that, you know, the, the Muslims came in and destroyed temples, this is a, a, such a crude oversimplification that one can hardly bear to sort of listen to it. Uh, the complication is this, that if you look at the location of Buddhist monuments, they're always impinging on the earlier megalithic sites, burial sites. The megalithic. The megalithic burial sites. There are you know, many cases, uh, not invariably every case, but in many cases it's quite marked. They're either impinging on or they're adjoining. Now, why do they choose to build their particular monuments so close to an existing monument? Is it because they are asserting that this was a sacred site and therefore we are taking over the sacredness of this site, which could be one argument? Or is it to assert that we are a much more powerful religion and we are replacing the earlier religion, which is an equally feasible argument? Then you have, once Buddhism is established, you have uh, the Hindus coming along and converting uh, 
Buddhist halls of worship into temples. It is Shankaracharya and much earlier, much earlier, much earlier places like Thir and Shezarla, um, where the, the Chaitya Hall of the Buddhists, which is this beautiful hall with sculpture and the votive stupa at one end, um, is happily converted into the mandapa of a Hindu temple. Uh, this happens in frequently, many many cases. One can when one can spot it. Or you have a very overt antagonism. It's extremely interesting. One hasn't been through the texts with a tooth comb, but this needs to be done. Uh, Kalhana, writing in the 12th century, a uh, Brahman from Kashmir, who wrote the history of Kashmir in his very famous book, The Raj of the He talks about how uh, rulers in Kashmir attack the Buddhist monasteries in Gandhar. Gandhar was the region, the borderland between what is today Pakistan and Afghanistan. They attack the monasteries, they kill the monks. And this is there in Kalhana's Rajatarangani. This is written in Kalhana's Rajatarangani. That in, in the, the period when this happens is roughly uh, the period when uh, the Hunas are in power, Mehirakula and Thoramana and so on. So it would be about the sort of fifth, sixth centuries AD. Uh, so you have that going on. Now, it's not on a huge scale, but it's there. And one has to come to terms with the question of why is it there? Uh, then you have, all right, yes, the, the Muslim, the Turks and the Afghans come in and start destroying temples. Uh, they didn't destroy as many as is popularly thought. Uh, the popular opinion is that they destroyed 3,008 Whereas uh, Richard Eaton, who has done a meticulous study of every reference to the destruction of a temple, has said that you can only account for 80 temples having been destroyed. Only 80. Only 80, as compared to this other figure. Now, the question, of course, is uh, why? Uh, again, you're back to say, what is very interesting is that uh, the temples that are destroyed are not the small, strongly religious ones. It's always the big temple, the wealthy temple, the temple that is, uh, you know, politically important and economically important. They're targeted. Uh, so one has to say that there are three elements that go into this temple destruction. One is the religious element. We don't like this religion. They're worshipping images. It's against Islam, so we will destroy their images. And what is interesting, again, is that the Somnath temple, for example, Mahmud destroys the idol. He desecrates the temple, but he doesn't totally destroy the temple, as, it, as is generally believed. And then, of course, it was uh, reconstructed later on. And before Mahmud destroyed it, it had been destroyed several times? No. By other kings? No, no. Um, all right, so one is the religious element. Hmm? The second is that if it is a temple with a large treasury, then clearly it's loot. And this is true of uh, every temple that is destroyed. There is usually, it, the choice of the temple is usually one that has a treasury so that you get something out of it. Uh, Mahmud is interesting because he destroys Hindu temples, rich Hindu temples. He also destroys mosques that are run by the Shias. And the chronicles have this sort of repeated refrain. He killed 50,000 Kafirs and he killed 50,000 Shias. It's regular. Uh, so one doesn't know whether, you know, you don't believe the figure and then you say, where, where it's, it's religious animosity, uh, animosity at a certain level. So there's that, there's the financial thing. And the third thing that we must remember is that the temple, the rich temple, the temple that is associated with the capital city and is patronized by the rulers is a statement of power. Yeah. It's only when the ruler becomes truly important, politically important, that he builds his royal temple and declares that he has become politically important. So the attack on the temple is also an attack on political power. Now this is common not just to India, but it's common the world over, that financial inputs, religious animosity, and 
the uh, attack on political authority are three reasons why religious monuments are attacked. But again, Kalhana has a very interesting description in the Rajatarangani, where he mentions that over a period of about two centuries in Kashmir, there was a series of kings, Hindu kings, who attacked Hindu temples and looted Hindu temples. Uh, and one begins to wonder, as you're reading, as I was reading the text, I began to think, you know, how can this be possible? Why are they attacking Hindu temples? Then you come to the reign of the very famous king Harshadeva, uh, who is not only looting temples, he's desecrating temples, his officers, and he appoints a special category of officers known as the officers for the uprooting of the gods. That's the definition. That's the definition. Deva Utpananayaka. Now, you have to ask yourself the question that here it's not religious antagonism. Here it is pure and simple loot. And, and Kalhana says that. He has a very interesting analysis of this and says that there was a fiscal crisis. And the only place from which wealth could be obtained in a hurry and easily was by looting temples. And he does this. So my point about this is really that we shouldn't rush to give one reason to explain this. It is a very complex story. It touches on many levels of both individual and social behavior. Um, and there are many examples of people preserving temples and there are other examples of people conserving temples. Uh, who are not Hindus, there are other examples of Hindus defending mosques and so on. It's very much a case of what is the local politics, what is the local financial situation, what is the local religious feeling that determines this. This, this leads to my next question, that how should the teaching of history and social studies be revitalized, given this threat from a supremacist government, ideology, and what would you tell a young person who now has access outside the official text? How should he or she approach the learning of history? Well, I think the first thing really to explain is that history is not a body of information consisting of debate, dates and events. History is an understanding of the past. And I would underline again and again the word understanding the past. It is not even what was the truth, it's not even what was correct or anything. We don't know. Yeah. The past can't be revived. We'll never know what the absolute truth was about the past. The maximum that we can do is to use various methods of analysis to try and arrive at the understanding of a problem, the problem being the reconstruction of the past. Now, if you're speaking to a young person and you want to make this point clear because it sounds very abstract, I would say that you, you turn to the person and you say, look, you're surrounded by all kinds of things. There's a whole world of objects that surrounds you. There's a whole world of relationships that surround you. There's a whole world of thoughts that you think. Each of these has a history. The chair you're sitting on has a history, the house you're living in has a history, the town you're living in has a history. Um, so what are we doing with this history? Are we really understanding it? Because like the biography of a person, when you meet a person for the first time and you get to like the person and you become slightly friendly, inevitably you ask the question, what is your name? Where do you come from? How much does your husband earn? How many children do you have? Where do you originally come from? What language do you speak? It is the history of the person. The biography is essentially the history of the individual. In the same way, the whole world that surrounds us has a biography, which is history. And in order to understand the world that surrounds us today, we have to understand what happened in the past. We have to know how we have arrived at this point today. This has been a long process of evolution and change and continuity and change and so on. That has to be understood and that is really what history is about. So going to the original text, understanding the language, looking at different interpretations and I think 
keeping your own identity outside the learning and teaching of history is critical. Well, that is very difficult yeah. to do. It's very difficult to keep your own identity outside because, you know, as we all know, uh, without uh, having to go to deconstruction, we all know yeah. that everybody has an identity which creeps in. Yeah. However much one says, yeah. I don't have a bias. Mm. And I have a great... Um, suspicion of people who come to me and say, I write good history because I'm not biased. I feel like saying this is nonsense. Of course you're biased. We're all biased. It's a question of are we aware of our bias? And do we explain when we're writing our history that there is a bias which will come through? You'll understand. But the test is not so much whether it's biased or unbiased. The test is whether um, a, the evidence that you're quoting is reliable. You can't say that somebody said to me that Mahmoud of Ghazni raided 77 times. You know, what is the evidence for your saying so? You must have evidence, and the evidence must be reliable, which means in our terms, in historical terms, if it is written evidence, it's much easier to handle than an oral tradition, even though an oral tradition may be equally reliable, but a written evidence is always much easier to handle. Okay. So your reliable evidence is the first step. Secondly, history is um, a study in causal relationships. Because A happened, it led to B. And because B happened, it led to C. There's a whole chain of events that connects. And we are working back on that chain and getting back to the beginning. Now, those causal relationships, when they are being established by the historian, must be based on logic and rationality. They cannot be mystical, they cannot be mythological. They have to be logical and rational. Which is why there's a world of difference between history and mythology, history and faith. I'm not saying that mythology has no value, it has a lot of value, but you cannot take mythology as history without putting it through this test. Yes. And the test is very important. And this, in a sense, is also something that distinguishes the big change that happened to the discipline of history in the 1960s or 70s. Which, which was? Which is that prior to that, history was regarded as Indology. And Indology simply means the study of something Indian. It can be the study of seashells from the coastline of uh, Gujarat, or it can be you know, brick temples from, Bangal uh, from Bengal, or whatever. Anything Indian, the study of that becomes part of Indology. When history becomes a social science, it then begins to observe certain rules of uh, evidence collection, analysis, and how these analyses are put together in the context of other social sciences, in the sense that yeah. there's a working together of sociology, economics, anthropology, history, demography, you name it. So that the, the, the causes, the range of causes gets widened. For example, today, uh, when they're discussing the decline of the Harappan cities, there was a time when everybody said it was an Aryan invasion. That went out. Then everybody said it was a massacre of some kind, and they ran short of food, there was disease, and a so on. Major disaster. Major disaster. <coughs> now the argument is environmental change. Yeah. You know, deforestation, change of river courses, climate change. So as you begin to introduce more and more ways of looking at the problem, the range of causes gets broader, and history becomes much more realistic then. I mean, this is not to say that you take the romance out of history, but that comes at another level. Yeah. The basic history becomes more realistic. Since you mentioned the Harappan civilization, before I go to my next question, I just wanted to, this attempt again to constantly link the Harappan script, which has posed you know, huge challenges to historical understanding. And we've reached thus far, but no further, with the Indo-Aryan script, and then therefore to provide that again, that that link which becomes one of a community superiority, etc., and that claim on the ancient Indian past. How, how is that worked out? Well, that's really, in some senses, logical. <laughs> because in the 19th century, the earliest, the foundation of Indian civilization were the Vedic texts. They were the earliest bit of evidence we had. And so the whole construction of the Hindu Arya was based on the Vedic texts. Right. 
Um, nobody, of course, mentioned that at that time in the 5th, 4th uh, centuries BC, there were a lot of people who were opposed to the Vedic texts, like the Buddha, and Mahavir, the Ajivakas, the Charvaks, and so on. Very solid body of people known as the Nastikas by the Vedic Brahmins. The public intellectual that you said questioned. That's about. right, yes, the public intellectuals. So the beginnings of the Hindu civilization were the Hindu Arya, the Vedic Aryan. Now then, in the 20s, they discovered this civilization which is earlier than the Vedic. So what do you do with this? You try and prove that it was Aryan by saying that the, the script should be read as um, Vedic Indo-Aryan. That doesn't seem to work. There are others who are reading it as Dravidian. Attempts are being made, there's one attempt now being made this very moment practically in Chennai by Mahadevan who's reading it as Dravidian uh, pictograms yeah. with an Indo-Aryan cross-check kind of thing. Very interesting pieces. But nothing is proven. We don't know. So if you're going to say that uh, the roots of India lie in the Aryan civilization, you have to take it back to the Harappan. It's logical. because. Otherwise, you have to argue, as some of them do, that the Vedic texts are pre-Harappan, which takes them back to 5000 BC, 4000 BC to bring them up to 3000, uh, for which the evidence is really not available. Uh, but otherwise, then you have to say that they were all Aryans together. So now let's see where that takes us. The travelogue, the travelogue in history, mm -hmm. that the traveller who wrote, who travelled, travelled to different civilizations. Which are the travelogues and the travellers from the ancient Indian period, which are important to understand in that period? Well, I would say uh, the, the people that, that wrote, uh, the Greeks, some of them, the Hellenistic Greeks, not the Greeks from the Greek mainland, uh, but the Greeks that were settled in West Asia. Uh, Megasthenes is one who Unfortunately, we don't have his original text, but we have quotations from three different authors, uh, which more or less agree, though not completely. Um, very interesting narrative because, in a sense, he tries to bring what is happening in India in terms of rulership, state systems, social stratification, in uh, tune with what is happening in West Asia and Egypt and so on. There's a whole bunch of these people writing historical or narrative accounts of these different parts of uh, uh, the world from okay. Egypt to West Asia to India. Uh, what, is, what has been most discussed in, uh, in the Me Megasthenes account is uh, the, the slight confusion that he creates over land tax and tax, was it rent or was it tax, which is a very fundamental difference, difference in terms of land ownership. Uh, then he talks about seven castes. Mm -hmm. So that raises the interesting question of what is he talking about when he's talking about castes, because seven is certainly no number that fits anywhere. One can understand four, one can understand five, one can understand an infinity, infinity. but yeah. seven <coughs> is, is awkward. Anyway, there have been lots of attempts to try and explain that. Then, very interestingly, I think, uh, and this has not been made much of, uh, he refers to the philosophers, by which he means the religious people, and he says that there are two trends of thought, the Brahman, the Brahmanes, as he calls them, and the Sarmanes, Brahmans and Shramans. Now, Shraman is the word that was used for Buddhists, Jains, Ajivaks, and so on, uh, in a sense, all those that were opposed to Vedic Brahmanism were generally dismissed and they were either called Nastik because they were not believers in the sacrality of the Vedas or they were called Shramans. And he uses this duality. And then if you look at the Indian texts, it goes on being referred to. Patanjali, writing the Sanskrit grammar around the turn of the Christian era, says, that uh, the, Herm, the when he's talking about dharma and religion and worship and so on, and he says there are these two groups, the Brahmins and the Shamans, and their relationship to each other is like the snake and the mongoose, uh, which is one of my favorite quotations. 
and, and it goes on. All right, that's his contribution. Then we have the Chinese Buddhist monks and travelers who come searching for the Western heavens, searching for Buddhist manuscripts and texts, of which uh, there's Fa Hien, who wrote a little travelogue, really, more than anything else. But the much more serious work of Hyun Xian, where he gives a, a, an itinerary of all his travels and describes in detail where there are still Buddhist uh, uh, places of worship, where there are Hindu temples and whether there are larger numbers of temples as compared to the Buddhist uh, viharas and so on. Uh, very, very detailed and extremely meticulously recorded. In fact, when Alexander Cunningham in the 19th century decided to do some archaeological work, he just picked up uh, Hyun Sang. One of the things he did was that he, he picked up Hyun Sang and he kept reading his description and saying, oh, he says 90 li to the northeast. And so he went 90 li to the northeast. And a lot of his discovery of Buddhist sites actually worked. Were, were pretty closely uh, uh, aligned to, to what was said. I mean, they weren't precise, but it gave him a rough idea that this is the kind of area in which one will find looking, yeah. Buddhist yeah. sites. Anyway, so there, was, there were them. And then, of course, what concludes the, what used to be called the ancient period, which I prefer to call early India, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, is, is the Alberuni's account, yeah. which is, of course, excellent in the sense that, you know, he, he, was an, he was a real intellectual who was deeply, deeply interested in this new culture and country that he came to. What fascinated him? I think the fact that it was so different. You know, he, he knew Central Asia, he knew Afghanistan. And according to some people, it was Mahmud who kind of exiled him and said, now you go to India. Oh. Uh, I don't know if this story is apocryphal, but anyway, it's a story that we, we were all told as students. But he comes here and he becomes extremely interested in the religion, in the worship, in the culture, and in the mathematics and the astronomy. And he's one of the people who writes very, very intelligently about what he sees and what his discussions have been. So learning about al Biruni's writing would be very, very interesting for a student of history. Extremely He's written a wonderful passage about Banaras, yes. a beautiful passage yes. about Banaras. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. I believe every civilization also has an Achilles heel in, in, in the dominant political discourse. And is our kind of Achilles heel the Brahmanical caste system and the trying to tell ourselves that we are a non-violent civilization? That, that was my question and linked to that is a slightly contradictory question with using your, trying to understand your phrase when you said fortunately Indian civilization was not dogged by the existence of Satan. So oh, how yes. do these two things yes, sort the of... sentence has <laughs> often been quoted back to me. Um, let me start with the sentence first because that's easier to explain. What I was really referring to in this, in this passage is that um, the importance of Satan to Christianity is two things. One is that he tempts Eve and you have the original sin, which in a sense gives you attitudes to gender and sexuality. And then of course Satan is the personification of evil. Uh, and when I said that that in a sense uh, the absence of Satan is partly the sanity, what I was really referring to was that you didn't have then this Judeo-Christian obsession with gender and sex to that extent. Uh, of course you had people, I mean, you know, the, 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 the argument that uh, the woman in ancient times was much venerated and respected, uh, this is a complete exaggeration because yes, some women were venerated and, ex and respected as they are everywhere. But the majority were not. I mean, even the Rig Veda, for example, uh, talks about uh, women as chattel when it mentions the, the gift of 50 dasis and things like that. And in the Mahabharata, when uh, Yudhishthir is describing his wealth, he talks about dasis and describes them as chattel. So we know that for, the, for, for large numbers of women, uh, life was not really all that pleasant. But anyway, uh, the, the point that I was really trying to make was that there wasn't this uh, 
desire that, that grew up in Christian Europe to condemn anything that had to do with sexuality and gender. And that was the main thing. Evil, again, I think that we, uh, that, that uh, the Indian tradition is very aware of evil, evil and is, is always preaching against the pitfalls of evil. I mean, one has to only read the Bhagavad Gita to realize that. But it seems to be less of a demonic evil. Now, this may be just my version of interpreting the text. But I think it was somewhat less demonic than the way in which uh, Satan is depicted in the Judeo-Christian tradition. So that was really the point that I was trying to make with that sentence. On the question of nonviolence and tolerance and so on, um, I do believe that this was something that was required as part of the nationalist message, and therefore tended to be overemphasized in the nationalist ideology. If you take someone like Ashoka, for example, who is always quoted as uh, the first person that talked about religious coexistence when he says, you must honor the other man's sect more than even you <coughs> honor your own, because in, it is by this that you uh, really pay your respect to the other person. That's fine. He says that again and again, and one assumes uh, that whatever antagonisms there were at that time, he was referring to those and was suggesting that you persuade people to your point of view rather than clobbering them on the head and saying, you've got to agree with me. But when it comes to the Buddhist Sangha, he has edicts or inscriptions rather, where he says very clearly, uh, directed to the monasteries, where he says very clearly that dissident monks and nuns are to be dressed in white and are to be banished from the monastery. And when you put the two things together, you wonder, you know, where does the coexistence go? In the one case, it's very apparent. In the other case, it is something <coughs> quite different. And in a sense, this again goes back to what I was saying earlier, that many of these uh, notions and ideas really have to do with uh, the politics and the sociology of what is going on at that time. You can't divorce them. You can't say that religion is something which is completely separate and has nothing to do with the reality of one's social life. It is very deeply linked, and, and so this is the reason why. But then, on the whole, I would say that if you look at Indian history, it probably doesn't have the kind of extreme uh, notions of uh, ex extreme articulation of um, violence that you get, for example, in the Inquisition. I mean, I'm very interested that it is in medieval Europe at the time when violence and oppression is quite strong by the church, that you first get the mention of banning and burning books, which is what we are doing now. And so every time I hear someone talk about banning and pulping and burning books, like Dinanath Batra, like Dinanath Batra and others, Subrahman Swami, Swami has said the same thing, my mind goes back to medieval Europe where this is what was the message that the church was giving. There were some books that were put on the index, which meant that they were banned. You couldn't read them. And there were other books that were burnt. And there were regular occasions when you had the burning of books. Uh, so in a funny kind of way, we have had, let's say, perhaps a relatively better tradition on this, which we're now going back on. But the Brahmana, Shashamana, and the Mongoose and Snake, how did that work out? They were parallel traditions? They they were parallel traditions. Other. They were parallel traditions. There was no violence? Uh, there might have been. I mean, as I say, Kalhana does talk about violence. I don't know. There may be other references. We have tended generally to be so taken up with the theory that we were an entirely nonviolent people that we have not paid much attention to the texts that might have been talking about violence. We still have to examine them and see what they say. Uh, 
but otherwise, you know, I mean, they're, they're parallel traditions. It's not that they don't abuse each other. I mean, the uh, Vishnu Puran, for example, talks about uh, people who wear the red robe. This is the Jains and the, uh, well, not the Jains, the Buddhists more. And it talks about the others too, who remove all the hair from their body and so on. And says that they are deluders, refers to them as Mahamoha the great deluders who are leading people astray. So there is an abuse that goes on. Uh, but whether this abuse took the form of physical violence every time, one doesn't know. There isn't a reference to that. You know, <clears throat> one of the interesting things about the, like you said, early Indian period, I, we shouldn't be calling it the ancient Indian period, is that Aryabhatta, for instance, mm. <coughs> using the genius of his mathematical calculus almost a millennium years before Copernicus, yeah. uh, Copernicus and Galileo spoke about you know, how the earth mm. uh, going around the sun. But this is quite different from saying that the existence of Lord Ganesha means there was plastic surgery in, you oh, know. Oh, yes. So, I mean, how, how would you, I mean, explain, I mean, that we need to be certainly proud of certain uh, uh, path breaking. Uh, Look, the, the, the thing is that, you know, one is extremely proud of mathematics and astronomy and medicine in early times. But the pride is not that you just say, I'm very proud and stop. The pride is to understand why these things developed, evolved, emerged, and what people did with them. I mean, you take Aryabhatta. He comes up with this theory, which is based on very meticulous mathematical calculation and astronomical observations. There were no telescopes then, so they observed the planets with the naked eye and so on. There was a debate that went on. When he said this, there, was, there were other people like Brahmagupta who said, we don't agree. And there was a debate. And what interests me and interests many of us as historians is how did this knowledge evolve from the earliest times onwards? Uh, who enunciated these theories, what were these theories, what was the debate on the theories? And the other very fundamental question. Look, Aryabhatta does this. Uh, we're told that in the 15th century, there were Kerala mathematicians who had discovered calculus. And I remember going to a seminar where there was a discussion on whether the Portuguese Jesuits were not tracking down this bit of knowledge and sending it back to Europe. And did calculus in Europe emerge as a result of this? Now, people at this conference, which was held in Kerala, thought there wasn't enough evidence to prove this. But what interested many of us was that in Europe, Copernicus and Galileo, when they come up with this theory, uh, become forerunners to other advances in science, yeah. to which this theory was very important. Yeah. Although Galileo had to recant because yeah. the Catholic Church objected That's to his right. saying that. Why didn't that happen in India? That's a very fundamental question, that you have this bit of knowledge and you have people debating it and discussing it. You have it even traveling to Baghdad, where, which was the big center in those days from the seventh century onwards. Uh, but it somehow doesn't go any further. Why? Well, this is something that scientists should answer. Okay. This is where I think that the history of science in India needs desperately to be written mm. and to be written correctly. You mentioned Ashoka mm -hmm. and you were under 30 when you did your work on Ashoka and the decline of the Mauryas. And one of the things that is uh, very important to that work is that you, you, you deconstructed Ashoka as not somebody who was in spite of his time, but representative of his time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, connecting up with what you said about him a little while ago, what is it about Ashoka's Dhamma that, is, that, is, that was important, is important to understand, and his multilingual policy that he followed through the edicts, which depending on where their geographical location used different languages? Well, I think that the most important aspect, two, two things to, about his edicts from which we get the maximum information about him. Uh, one is that he is concerned with the problems facing society at that time and therefore 
he says that dhamma means uh, you know, treating people properly, te uh, teachers and students, parents and children and so on, Brahmins and shamans, he makes a big issue of that as well. In other words, that he's concerned that society should work harmoniously. Uh, and it seems that there were tensions at that time, otherwise he wouldn't go on and on about the need but for this. But this huge transformation as we were brought up with about the transformation after the Kalinga war. That I don't accept. That I don't accept because in that very edict where he talks about the Kalinga war, he does say that he was interested in these ideas and at first he says I was not very zealous and only after that I became zealous. So my reading is that there wasn't a dramatic overnight transformation. It was not the story of Constantine who saw the cross in the sky and then converted to Christianity. It's really a, a, a declaration of the fact that he was interested in these ideas, he thought they were useful, uh, they made an appeal to him, and then slowly and gradually when he saw the suffering that had been caused at the Kalinga War, the whole thing came back to him in a way in which he became much more involved in these ideas. The multilingual part I think is extremely important because it's not only multilingual but his edicts that are written in Prakrit observe the differences and variations of the local Prakrits. So like dialects? Like dialect. So the second aspect of his edicts is that he wants everybody to know what he is thinking and why he is thinking what he is thinking. And he says so, that wherever people can read them well and good, where they can't read them, I expect my officers to read them out. Um, so I think there's a great consciousness and awareness of not being a distant monarch uh, who almost pays no attention to his subjects, but being deeply involved with the people whom he's governing. Uh, Professor Thapa, we were just going to talk about Lord Ganesha and plastic surgery in oh, yes. early India. Oh, yes. Um, well, I've, um, I did have a chat the other night with some doctor friends of mine. Uh, who were very upset because they said it's not plastic surgery anyway, it's transplant. <laughs> so there is a technical uh, problem there. But anyway, but seriously. Um, you know, it's one thing to take pride in a genuinely scientific um, exercise, discovery, invention that took place in ancient times. That is absolutely legitimate. But to try and take inventions that are chronologically and otherwise completely out of context and push them back 2,000, 3,000 years, that is something which is unacceptable. One must realize that in every scientific discovery or every scientific action, there is a long period of evolution. Science and technology are not things that happen overnight. Not like the milk for the Ganesha. Which ah, that, that, that is not science. Um, with science, if you take something like technology, for example, you take the aeroplane. There's a period when wheels are invented. There's a period when a box is invented. There's a period when the motion of the box carrying you from A to B is brought in because of bullocks or horses or some kind of animal power. Hmm? Power is necessary. And that goes on for centuries. And then somebody invents the combustion engine. So the combustion engine then over a period of one generation is reformulated to fit this box with four wheels and it becomes a car. And that goes on and then over a long period of time, at least half a century if not more, you study aerodynamics. And those studies then gradually lead you on to inventing a machine which takes off the ground and goes into the air. Now, all of this, I mean, even if you leave out the box with the wheels right at the beginning and you go only to the combustion engine, A, it takes a long time, and B, each step in that argument, each step in that invention is recorded. 
Because unless you record that <coughs> invention, you cannot move on to the next. I mean, this is what modern knowledge is all about, that you have the information, you record it, and then someone comes along, questions that information, experiments with it, and then you move on to the next thing. Now, if there were aeroplanes in the Ramayana, and Ram and Sita flew back from Sri Lanka, where are the records of people who made these aeroplanes? They're absolutely non-existent. Where are the records of aerodynamics? They're non-existent. So the point that I'm trying to make is that in all of these inventions, whether it's stem cell research, whether it is putting a head, uh, an elephant's head onto a human body, uh, whatever it may be, there has to be, first of all, an evolution of that knowledge. There has to be a discussion. There has to be a debate which is recorded as to how that knowledge came about, who took it forward, or if it not, how was it taken forward? I mean, it can be anonymous. How was it taken forward? What are the kinds of inventions that go into the making of that final product? All this is completely absent. We know from the final product today that it has taken centuries to get to this point in a particular culture where that kind of knowledge is being explored and is being used. So suddenly to hop from something that is non-existent and to say, oh yes, we had it then, makes absolutely no sense. And then as a friend of mine said the other day, I mean, yeah, yeah, I've talked to, to scientists too, because I'm frank, frankly very worried that there hasn't been a reaction from the scientists. Been One been. small body of doctors <coughs> did write a letter to EPW and say that, you know, it doesn't behove people in authority to say things like this. But the scientists are quiet. But the scientists are quiet on all these inventions. Now, you may turn around and say, Are ye to bilkul hai. But if you are a scientist with a sense of responsibility to your citizenry. That means a public intellectual. The public intellectual. This is where the public intellectual comes in. The public intellectual has to get up and say, sorry, this doesn't hold. And these are the reasons why it doesn't hold. You can't just dismiss it. You must explain why you're dismissing it. But to end on another note, I was talking to a friend of mine who said the other day, but you know, if you go to Egyptian mythology, they give the heads of every animal to human beings. Someone's got a goat head, someone's got a buffalo head, someone's got an owl, someone's got a falcon, someone's got a... So were there lots of plastic surgeons then? <laughs> did we get our plastic surgery from the Egyptians or did the Egyptians get it from us? Interesting questions. On a very much lighter note, and you needn't answer it if you don't want to, but how would you then explain Lord Ganesha to the young? Just oh, it's, <laughs> it's a lovely bit of mythology. It's a charming story that, you know, he is irritated uh, with, with Parvati and uh, wants to do something. And so she says, you know, why did you why, give him a head again? You've taken away his head. And he picks up this elephant and gives him an elephant's head. Now, all right, you can have an anthropological explanation hmm, that the elephant, elephant's head is a totem. And what Ganesh actually represents is a clan which had an elephant head as its totem. Because remember that the other name, I mean, the name itself is very interesting, Ganesha, the lord of the Gana. The Gana is the clan. clan. So Ganapati, it's tied into the clan. Now, you can therefore examine it anthropologically and say that if you look at the language and the name, it may suggest this. Uh, and this is very common in religious mythology, that gods and goddesses are constantly inducting new creatures of all kinds because it becomes necessary to the story. It becomes necessary to the values that you're trying to describe. So in mythology, it is fine. But if you're going to use mythology to prove that, in fact, there was a scientific base in that time, then you have to draw the line. We are actually running the risk at the moment of this kind of extremely irresponsible uh, 
narrative being pushed down not only officially from the very top, but I mean, Dinanath Batra's supplementary texts are reaching 400,000 students in Gujarat. Mm -hmm. And it won't be far away that they might become part of the official textbooks everywhere, given the current regime's political hold on power. How then should the resistance build and where should it come from? This is something that has worried me a lot because, you know, very often you hear uh, in the course of conversation when you object to this kind of thing, people say, um, how do you know? Maybe we did have a plane, maybe we did have plastic surgery or whatever it may be. The only way in which you can attend to it is a way which the people who are currently controlling education will not attend to it is by introducing the whole question of how do you teach a child to think. That is the basic thing that education must do. It doesn't matter what the subject is. Yeah. How do you teach a child to think? Once you get that across and the child starts thinking analytically and carefully and debating the pros and cons of an argument, then half the battle is won. And there, what is one doing? One is really saying, please go back to the Indian tradition, where philosophically you started an argument by saying, my opponent is saying the following. That's the grace you give the opponent. That's the grace you give the opponent. I am objecting to this for the following reasons. And then the opponent's view and your view are debated and measured, and maybe a solution comes out. But that debate is absolutely essential. And that's what's absent today. And that's what's happening today, that there is no debate. In 1997, when you delivered the Kosambi lectures at Bombay University, you again broke very radical ground with, on two important historical narratives, Somnatha and Shakuntala. Mm -hmm. They also then resulted in two different books. Now, just the two narratives, if you could explain, because it was very important. One is the early medieval period, the other one is the early Indian period, uh, and, and, and there's a whole issue of gender and how, uh, how Shakuntala is looked at. If you could just say a few words about both well, those narratives. Well, the, the Somnath book, I must say that um, I was myself very intrigued as I went from one set of sources to another, because we have grown up on the theory, which comes from the Turco-Persian chronicles, that he came, he desecrated the temple, he broke the idol, uh, and that was the beginning of the Hindu trauma. That is the way these uh, chronicles were interpreted. When I looked at the chronicles, and I, since I don't know Persian, I asked the help of a colleague of mine who has excellent Persian, and we went through them. Um, the interesting thing was that they contradicted each other. The chronicles. The chronicles. Exactly. They're really not quite sure what he broke. Did he break a lingam? Did he break an image? Because one, at one stage they talk about him piercing <coughs> the belly of the image and a whole bunch of precious stones fell out of the belly. Uh, in the case of the lingam, one man says it's on the ground, the other man says it's suspended because they had a magnet in the ceiling and they placed the lingam on an iron bar. So the whole thing was suspended. Oh. Now, can you imagine a magnet that would be able to suspend a stone lingam, but never mind. And so this goes on. There's another lovely story about how uh, the image was actually the image of an Arabian uh, a goddess who was worshipped in Arabia called Manat. There were three goddesses and Muhammad had said very clearly, you people must stop wor <coughs> worshipping these goddesses because they're pre-Islamic. Uh, Lat, Uzzad, Manat. And the, one of the chroniclers says that this was actually the image of Manath that was brought to Somnath for safekeeping from Muhammad oh. and was being worshipped. And therefore, Mahmud of Ghazni was very anxious to destroy it because he would get the acclaim of having finally destroyed the third goddess that needed to be destroyed. So I was very intrigued by the fact that they don't agree. The, the, the descriptions... Within simply, the chronicles... Within the chronicles, they don't agree. All right. 
Then I went to the Sanskrit inscriptions, which people hadn't gone to earlier because we were all brought up on the idea that the Hindu period comes to an end in 1200. And so you use Sanskrit sources to, to 1200. And after that, you only use Persian sources. So even if you have Sanskrit sources, you don't use them because somehow, you know, in the medieval period, you only use Persian sources. So I started looking at the Sanskrit inscriptions, and they're fascinating inscriptions because a lot of them deal with the Temple of Somnath, its estates. And we're now into the 12th, 13th century. The traders, there's a Persian trader called Nuruddin who comes and has a legal contract drawn up with the local traders about getting land to build a mosque. And some of the land is from the Somnath estate. And it's given to him? And it's given to him to build a mosque because the mosque is referred to as a dharmasthan. And this is up 200 years this after? This is 200 years after the raid. All right. So you have that. And then later on, you have more inscriptions where the uh, chief priest of the Somnath temple is doing deals with all these traders, as in fact, in many of these wealthy temples, trade was one of the activities. I mean, quite apart from the religious activity, this was a side activity. Anyways, there was all that. Then I looked at the Jain chronicles, 14th century, early 15th century, 14th century. Uh, which are the, the one chronicle in particular, which is the history of the Chalukya dynasty, uh, where it describes uh, why Kumarapala decided to restore the temple of Somna, okay. which he does. And the reason that is given is very interesting. There's no mention of Mahmud. The temple is restored because it was dilapidated, and it was dilapidated because of two reasons. One is that the local ministers were wicked and didn't take any trouble to restore it and keep it in good condition. And the other was that it's on the shore and the sea spray came and weathered the temple. So the temple was restored. And I was kind of bothered about this and I thought, you know, this is so different from the story that is generally told. And part of the uh, nationalist narrative na is... Na absolutely. Yeah. So then somebody, one of my colleagues said, why don't you follow up the debate in the House of Commons? And I said, what was that about? And I was told that the Viceroy, the then Viceroy, had asked the then commander of the army who was fighting the war in Afghanistan to bring back from Ghazni the gates of the Somnath temple, the wooden gates of the Somnath temple that Mahmud of Ghazni had looted and taken back and had put in, uh, on, on the entrance of his own mausoleum. The gates came back to Agra, they were brought back, and when people looked at them, they realized there was nothing Indian about them, they were Egyptian. So there was a huge debate in the House of Commons mm -hmm. with people saying, the early 19th century, uh, with members of parliament saying, what is this viceroy up to? Why is he wasting money doing this kind of silly thing? Um, who is he appeasing, the Hindus or the Muslims? And in the course of that debate, they started talking about the Hindu trauma at the destruction of the Somnath temple. That is the first time that you get references. During colonial, so it's, it's like colonial historiography. Yeah. That's yeah, it's an invention of that debate. And then, of course, it's picked up, and it's picked up by various people here, like A. Munshi, who is a great uh, protagonist of the idea that there was a Hindu trauma and so on. And this whole issue ends up with the destruction of the Barbary Masjid to avenge the raid of Mahmud of Ghazni. The tragedy. And then, you know, I called it the many voices of a history because each of these sets of sources gives you a different version of the story. It's also something like one of my colleagues said this to me. He said it's like the story of Rashomon, the Japanese film. Yeah. The murder is committed and there are six people who each give a completely it. different interpretation of what happened. And I've left it open in the sense that I've said, well, you know, here is a situation that let's wait for more evidence to find out what exactly happened, but certainly the story that has been given to us has problems.
it's it's no wonder that Ramila Thapar is such a threat to the Hindu Yes, body. I gather the other day somebody rushed up to me and said that on Facebook they've listed ten anti-Indians and yours is the first name. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, how strange because my history actually begins with my first interest in nationalism and the cause of nationalism. But anyway, the Shakuntala story is very different. That was really something that grew out of my... I graduated from the Punjab University with literature honours and I was very interested at that stage in doing literature. And then I switched to it's history. It's a big loss to literature, huh? I, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> But uh, that started off with this question of what is the relationship between fiction to, and history. Uh, hi, where a historian knows that something is fictional, how does he or she look at it? And I picked up the Shakuntala story because it occurs again and again. It's in the epic, in the Mahabharat, it's Kalidas, there's a lovely Rajbhasha version. And then it's translated into English and German. And, and so Urdu on. also at that much uh, Urdu also at one point. Um, the epic version is very interesting. And then, then, yes, when I looked at all these versions, I realized that the way in which they were treating her as a woman was very different. In all these versions. In all these versions. And that intrigued me. The Mahabharat, she is a young, feisty woman who makes a condition and says, all right, we will have a Gandharva marriage, but the son born to me will be your heir. And he agrees. And then when time passes and nothing happens, she goes to his court and she's arguing it out like a case. You agreed to this. And for the rights of her child. And the rights of her child. All right. In the Shakuntala version, she's much more subdued. And he kind of muffs the antagonism uh, by bringing in the story of the curse and and the ring, um, so that Dushant really isn't all that guilty, and uh, you know, there's an extraneous. It's the Gupta period, no? It's the Gupta mm. period, yes, the golden age, <laughs> and this is where the extraneous element comes in. The Brajbhasha version is is very much like the Mahabharat version, where she's earthy, again no? very earthy, and she the language she uses is the language that you and I would hesitate to use. Uh, then it gets translated into English by William Jones, who's very worried because he finds it too erotic oh. for the English audience. And he's constantly trying to leave out little bits here and there. Um, and for example, he says there's, there's this one verse where he, Kalidas is describing her and says that the heaviness of her hips is such that as she walks across the sand, the stamp of her heel is quite deep in the ground, you see. And William Jones thought this was much too erotic, and so on. Anyway, but the interesting thing is, the thing is that his version is translated into German and is an absolute hit with the German Romantic movement. I mean, there is praise after praise, and, you know, she was such a great character, and this is such a great story, and so on. And, these Indians must be absolutely marvelous people that they can write these kinds of dramas, etc. Uh, back to British India, there's a little hesitancy as to whether it should be a college textbook because of the eroticism. Although everybody says it's the best play in Sanskrit and Sanskrit students should read it, finally they edit it and give it as a textbook. And then comes Tagore who has this long essay That's in which he talks about how it represents the clash, not the clash, but it represents the change between physicality and the spiritual. That the Gandharva marriage is physicality and both she and Dushyant have to do penance for that, which is their separation. And then finally they're cleansed and they come together. And I went through this and I thought, A, it says volumes about the way women are looked at in different periods of history by different authors coming from different Background. social backgrounds. And B, it tells you so much about how social attitudes have changed from one period to another. In, in the field of archaeology at this present point of time, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Burma, is there anything exciting happening? 
which we don't hear about because the dominant narrative is so suppressive. Uh, you mean in terms of exciting sites? Exciting sites, exciting explorations by young archaeologists, yeah, historians. Well, sites. You I were at a conference last year, I think. Uh, yeah. Exciting sites, I would say at the moment, nothing very dramatic has turned up. We know the sites that have potential and one is hoping that there will be time and effort and money to go and explore and excavate these sites. Archaeology itself is undergoing a very interesting change as a discipline oh. because there's more and more of science coming in. In fact, at one point when I was very much into archaeology, I moved away because I realized that if one doesn't have a scientific background in terms of knowing something about chemistry particularly or physics, mm. it becomes very difficult because a lot of the testing that they're now doing relates back to the sciences. And so to understand, for example, radiocarbon testing is now slightly out of date and there are many other tests, but they're all based on scientific um, ideas and theories and so on and, and experiments. Uh, so that is happening. The other thing that's happening is, of course, that um, the coming in of ecology and environmental studies, archaeology lends itself very much to yeah. that the study of soil, the study of forests, the study of uh, the composition of the soil. Wind, water, yeah. Oil, water, changing river courses, so geology mm -hmm. is also very important. And this is an interesting direction it's taking from its origins in civilization equaled arch archaeology, mm -hmm. which consisted of art objects and That's architecture right. and that kind of thing. Uh, now it's kind of changed. So it's a multidisciplinary kind of? Much more, much, much more, more so, yes. I mean, and not that the other things have, have declined. People are still very interested in architecture and in art objects and so on. But there's this whole new area which has also come in. DNA, for example, very important. Okay. I mean, I, I know nothing about DNA, therefore I hesitate to pronounce on it and I'm a little worried by the ease with which people run in and pick up skeletons and start doing DNA analysis, but it's there. Just a little bit on the personal side, I mean, you're going to be turning, I think, 83 in... 83. Uh, we going to see a autobiography of Ramin No, Atta? no, at the moment, nothing. At the moment, all that I'm doing is fiddling around, finishing off things which had deadlines that I hadn't met. Um, I certainly don't intend to do any major academic work because I thought that the book I produced last year on the historical tradition was big enough and fat enough <laughs> and said all that I wanted to say, which I've been wanting to say all my life. Um, there would be an autobiography. There may be incidental interviews like this and memoirs and that kind of thing. And uh, the time that you spend with your grandnephew on a racing car circuit? Oh, that is very precious time. Very, very so precious time. he's given time. you Ramila Thapar on a Ferrari and... That's right, and on a, on a Bugatti, yes. So yes. it was really wonderful, wonderful talking to you, Professor oh, Thapar. It was very nice indeed. And uh, just would love to see if you could also help me put together a list of documents which we could run with the interview for Surely. suggested reading for, yes. the, for the young people, because I think that would yeah, really I, that I mean, would be a help. Yeah, that would be yeah. really helpful for anybody yeah. who wants to go further right. into, into what we've talked about. Yes. Thank you so much for this Not wonderful time. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you so much. So that was this wonderful conversation we had with Professor Ramila Tapar. We'll see you again on the show soon. <laughs>